you for the organizers for this session um, the, uh, and the invitation to speak. Um, I will address points made in the original call for this session, uh, of course on the digital future, but also a bit on the ethics and the background of the democratization. That's why we do the fair sharing and the open uh, data. Uh, so I promise to return to these points, but first I will outline a bit of the case study and through Pam I will arrive there. Um, Citizen science uh, is part of, uh, and also the open data is part of what you could call the democratization of science. Um, all kinds of challenges uh, to, uh, to science uh, in the current society. Uh, so we're to share, to open access publications. We have to explain uh, to the public in simple language what we do and why we do it. And we have to, uh, to allow for participation. That Research is not a matter of professionals alone. In the field of history, heritage and archaeology, that takes the form of the question, who owns the past? Um, and, of course, the implicit answer is it's not the sole uh, right of professionals in academia to write up what our past was. Uh, private individuals can take part in research, and there is actually Human Rights Article 27, is the right to research and UNESCO devoted already in 1952 papers that acad uh, academics should cooperate with the public. However, archaeology has moved in the opposite direction the uh, previous decades. For instance, following La Valletta, there was an increasing professionalization and all countries created large infrastructures and large systems in which professional archaeologists did the job. Um, more attention for non-professionals at Barrow and now we're getting there that participatory heritage is a key word uh, now uh, adopted in many countries. Participatory government in general, but heritage is seen as a field where this can work. Um, a bit on metal detection, because there, there is this issue of participation is imminent. Archaeologists and the law in many countries are opposed to metal detection, but when we study their motivations, we find that they just want to keep a piece of history in their hands. They want to research, and of course that's happening a lot of other things that are not okay. For instance, objects get sold to the black market. But in principle, they want to participate in research. Archaeology is about finding stuff, isn't it? And they're finding stuff. So they think they're doing archaeology. They're not aware of our preservation in situ uh, principles, uh, for instance. And they say plowing and fertilizers do the damage and I'm salvaging them. So um, I'll leave that discussion here, uh, but the, uh, I'll stop now, yes. But um, in the Netherlands, uh, there was a change in the heritage law in 2016 and we're now allowing metal detection. And that's where we all uh, started uh, collecting the data. So, the previous situation, 40 years of illegal but generally tolerated private metal detection, but a low level of reporting. So, we as uh, researchers didn't know what was found and where it was in what collections. So, in 2016, the topsoil of 30 centimeters uh, was legalized to detect. Of course, not on scheduled monuments and find reports are mandatory. And um, the statistics are not completely uh, uh, gathered yet, but I can tell you that the 2017 reporting rate is at least 50% higher than the 2015 data in the older legislation. Um, I say at least because uh, find reports are still pouring in also uh, about 2017. So it is taking up and there is uh, cooperation and um, documentation of the finds. So the aims of our project is the systematic documentation of private collections, making them available for heritage and academic research and the broader public, via online publication in a linked open data base, improving the relationships between the private searches uh, and professional archaeologists. And we want, of course, uh, to contribute uh, to European cooperation with partners doing it the same way, or more or less the same way. We're not doing this alone, not just a university. No, there is a broad national cooperation of the heritage agency, museums, universities, associations uh, of volunteers and private individuals. The current state, uh, we started three years ago, almost exactly three years ago, 
Um, up till now, over 600 metal detector users, 6,000 locations, 60,000 finds are registered, of which there are 61 boards. Um, at the moment, 21,000 are available online, 37%. I don't like that, that's way too low. Um, but we're going to work on that in the last year. The reason for that is the way we work. We work with uh, standardized object descriptions, we call them reference time. What you see here to the left is the actual find. So it's a fragment, it has, is, uh, has uh, measurements, uh, dimensions of course, it's a copper alloy, it's gilded, so that's the fragment. And to the right is a standardized description of the crossbow brooch uh, of a certain group. Uh, where it belongs to. Um, and that takes some time to write up, but of course when that object is found 100 times, we connect this find 100 times to the same reference type. So these reference types uh, contain an ideal type drawing, a preference label, uh, uh, for instance label of hand roach, an alternative label or many alternative labels, uh, Nauheim fibula um, is the same thing, but you have to tell the computer, of course, that it's the same thing. Um, scope notes, uh, uh, definitions on the dating, the distribution, etc. What is very important that you map it to other thesauri, because we want uh, others uh, to be able to work with this data set. So we have to tell it uh, to what term it connects in other thesauri. And for instance, we're mapping to the Getty Artinac thesaurus and we tell them this is a in this case uh, it's a narrow match of the getty term brooch um, that is why we do this is of course that every data set can be mapped to each other every data set that is mapped to getty um, but the getty is not very refined it's not geared towards archaeology so actually uh, we should also um, develop other uh, or make connections to different thesauri, but this is the course uh, that we chose. So PAN is actually two things. It's a documentation and publication of privately owned artifacts, but it's also a reference collection of metal finds. It's bilingual, Dutch and English. It can be searched, this reference collection, independently from the find reports. Um, objects and reference types have uh, various URIs. Um, and, of course, expansions are always possible, so it has a potential as a European thesaurus or as a model for a later European thesaurus. So, we, um, although when writing up the application in 2015, I didn't know yet the FAIR uh, term, uh, the, the FAIR abbreviation, but we're pretty FAIR. Um, the reference collection can be approached via an API server, um, if institutions would want that. All images are free downloads under a CC4 license. Datasets can be downloaded as CSV or TXT experts, um, so scholars can get access to this download function. The location data is a point uh, where we have to be careful. It's not visible. The exact location of a find is not visible uh, on the public website. Detectorists are quite protective of their sites. Um, scholars do have access to the exact uh, data, but have to promise that they will not publish them in detail. Furthermore, exports are shared with DANS, our the Dutch uh, National Trusted Repository. Uh, that's both for safekeeping, just a backup, but also uh, because they um, make the connection to European databases such as Ariadne. So, and for this, uh, we, uh, for this uh, principles, we received the Dutch Data Prize last year, uh, which, yeah, we were, are really proud of. The public websites, uh, you can uh, order objects per period, you can search the map, uh, select provinces or municipalities uh, where you want to see the finds. Uh, the reference collection can be searched independently uh, and after login, scholars can analyze and export the data and the volunteers have, uh, can manage their own collection. For them, it's a fair collection management tool and that's part uh, why it's attractive to them. So the future. We were funded uh, for four years as the setup phase um, and we had the specific aim for the backlog of older collections. So the detector is starting in the 70s, uh, have huge collections and we wanted to safeguard these larger collections. Now we're in our last year and turning our eye to the uh, transfer of the uh, 
infrastructure to the National Heritage Agency. They take over um, this project in 2020 um, for new finds mostly. Um, and in preparation of that, we, we are trying to get a national pact together because it's important um, in the FAIR data and in the, uh, the, the citizen science uh, approach that I uh, started with, it's important that it's not imposed by a, heritage, by a governmental institution. It's vital that it's also supported by the volunteers, but also by archaeologists in the country uh, as well. So archaeologists of provinces, municipalities, scholars, museums and volunteers will come together in the coming months um, and discuss how they will use PAM and to what extent, whether it's next to different systems or whether it will be the only infrastructure. And of course, we hope that they agree to use and promote PAM as a central port of all artifact information. So what we aim for is that, of course, the Heritage Agency has the infrastructure, supports that, but that it's a shared national ownership of artifact heritage. That's what we aim for. I wanted to make a quick jump um, for the, on the durability issue to the uh, CIL, the, the very famous Corpus Inscription in Latinarum, started in 1853. Um, very influential. Every study in uh, Roman archaeology uh, it more or less makes use of it. 166 years later, it's still highly relevant to Roman period research. But will our digital uh, corpora achieve the same? I think other speakers have already uh, voiced their concern that this might not be, and there have been countless of websites and projects um, creating a database which is, well, not available anymore. Um, so what determined the success? Um, this is, are just some thoughts um, which we have to take uh, into account when comparing to digital repositories. Publication and distribution to all kinds of libraries was the form of open access, I think, of the 19th century. Um, there was an international standard for the publication of inscriptions and it was supported by a stable and powerful organization. So what do we have to arrange in the 21st century to achieve digital durability? Um, open access publication. Um, of course, the level of open access depends on the sensibility of personal information. Um, you can't make everything uh, open access. So think through which aspect you can open up and which uh, ones you have to keep. Um, not only the data, but also the metadata, of course. Um, and you can think of open access for various groups. So different groups of users have access to different kinds of data. Um, of course, we have to establish internationally accepted formats and interoperability. Um, data management, I think, must be done by this stable and central organization. But at the same time, um, yeah, the central, the, the digital infrastructure is at a stable organization, but at the same time, make sure that, the, uh, that also non-professionals and regional colleagues in the uh, case of archaeology um, can use it and will use it and have interest in using it. Uh, and of course, to ensure backup on various levels. I hope you visit our website and I thank you for your attention.